Hey there, Extra Historians! Welcome to Lies, the part of the show where we tell you all the things we left out, the stuff we got wrong, and occasionally I give you, you know, reviews of movies that have been out for months already. I'm Rob, I'm the head writer of Extra History, and we're going to be talking about The Little Ice Age. Uh, this was a series that a lot of people really, really wanted us to do. I kind of had a joke that this was like the Once in Future series, because we mentioned it a little bit in extra sci-fi, but every, every topic vote, no matter what the theme was, someone would suggest the Little Ice Age. So here it is, probably our most anticipated and requested series. Uh, first of all, this whole show and lies is made possible by our patrons. Thank you so much. Uh, if you're not a patron, you could consider joining on Patreon. We, uh, you could, we have a Discord that you could be a part of. You could uh, suggest and vote for topics. And uh, in general, be a part of our community. If you can't join, thank you for being here. Thank you for uh, being part of the conversation, because history is a conversation. We are also part of the Nebula First program. If you go over to Nebula, you can see the first episode of our next series on Wu Zetian. It is going to be a really cool series. Okay, recommended reading is The Little Ice Age, How Climate Made History, 1300 through 1850, by Brian Fagan. Uh, another Brian Fagan book, the Great Warming, Climate Change, and the Rise and Fall of Civilizations. This um, isn't wholly about the, middle, the Little Ice Age, though. Uh, Nature's Mutiny, How the Little Ice Age of this Long 17th Century Transformed the West and Shaped the Present by Philip Blom. And The Frigid Golden Age, good title. Climate Change, The Little Ice Age, and the Dutch Republic, 1560 to 1720 by Dagamore de Groot. And he's um, been on a few podcasts. He's very interesting a uh, very interesting guy who uh, his specialty is how the Dutch Republic was uh, affected by, by this period. YouTube question. This is one of my favorite topics, especially because it bleeds into so much of uh, their everyday lives, influ including fashion and culture. One reason I love doing topics like this from time to time is it's a good thing mentally to disconnect yourself from always covering kind of famous names or uh, the great events. Right, and just remember that for most people in history, how much it rains is one of the most important things in your life. If it rains too little, if it rains too much, you're in trouble. Um, and you know, a lot of people just spent their lives in farming or manufacturing and didn't really care that much necessarily about what was going on politically. Um, and I think we do kind of have agricultural history be a sideshow to other topics and say, like, how does agricultural history affect the French Revolution, when we probably should be saying, like, here's how agricultural history changed France. It's a great thing to occasionally talk about something that, you know, my, my mom's side of the family is from the Panhandle of Texas, the Amarillo area. And, uh, you know, my grandparents all grew up on farms, and the first thing that family talks about when they sit down to a dinner table is what is the weather like? What is the weather like next year? Speculation about what what, what the weather is going to be like the rest of the year or next year. Um, you know, it's it's almost like a like a joke, right? Um, because it's so it's you could set your watch to this conversation. Um, so it's it's just a part of part of life that we don't always explore that much. I have a master's degree in medieval history and did a fair amount of coursework around the early modern period as well. It's fascinating to hear about so many of the events I knew about already and then connect them to this climatic cooling event. Truly a framework I hadn't even considered before. Um, yeah, it was a big thing for me too because I did a lot of urban history, right? So uh, I, I was doing a lot of City of London like type of stuff academically and um, so th this wasn't so much on my radar. And that the period I read a lot about um, the latter 18th century, a lot of these problems had started to like get solved a little bit as far as there, there just aren't these major famines coming through England anymore. Um, yeah, and it's, it's opened up kind of a lot of interesting doors for me uh, in, in how to look at different periods. Uh, episode 1, YouTube question, why do people keep calling the sun radioactive? Radioactive star, bad phrase, again, very misleading. In practical use, not just popular use, radioactive is applied to the results of fission, Almost no fission takes place in our local star. It's fusion at the core of the star, and the upper parts of the star are just glowing due to being very hot. Um, I mean, it does it does emit magnetic radiation, 
Um, so I, I, that is true. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying I didn't get that wrong. I'm just saying that the, um, what I was trying to get across with that is that there are processes that have been going on throughout all of human history that until recently, uh, we have not been able to understand, or clearly I've not been able to understand even today. Um, but, uh, it's, it's just very mind blowing for me to kind of, in our modern world, it's easy to realize this, right? That the sun is a star and it's just closer to us and we're, we're orbiting it. But um, once you kind of read back and start thinking in from the perspective of like a medieval European, I find personally that some of that stuff kind of gets pushed out, right? Um, and because if you're thinking from a medieval context, it's like, you know, you think the sun is something completely different, right? And that the system of the universe works in a, in a different way. But uh, it's good to occasionally step back and be like, no, but this is how it actually works. And this is how it was affecting them in a way that they could not even fathom. Um, and I don't know, I just found that incredibly mind blowing. Similar, uh, my being being bad at scientific nomenclature. The Little Ice Age is a theory, isn't a theory; it's a hypothesis. Huge difference. Please use the correct nomenclature, especially for climate change deniers. I'm sorry. Uh, quick suggestion: Modern historical terminology tries not to be Eurocentric, and as only Europe became colder and other parts of the globe became hotter, you should call the Little Ice Age the medieval climate anomaly. Uh, anomaly. This is a, a very contentious part of the argument. We sort of talked about this later on in the series. It's unclear whether the Little Ice Age was an Atlantic event, just affecting, you know, mostly uh, uh, Europe and North America, or if it was a Northern Hemispheric event, uh, because we do know that uh, there are findings consistent in China uh, with it having affected, uh, affected things there. But then there's also emerging evidence uh, from New Zealand glaciers that they were at some of the greatest extent uh, in, in, um, in human history during the modern minimum. So, it, it, again, this hypothesis is evolving. It depends on which evidence you, uh, you bring into it. I purposely did a, and I said this in the episodes, I purposely started it in 1300 so that we could talk about the, the famines and things like that in the early series. Whereas there are people who absolutely say like, no, this started in uh, the, the 17th century only. Like everything else is just, you know, erratic, erratic weather for different reasons. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's still patchy and people are still discovering. Um, I'm always going to err on the side of using the terminology that people are most likely to Google, right? Um, there, there are, people do call it the medieval climate an anomaly. Then you get into <laughs> problems with the word medieval. So, uh, I, I, is absolutely point taken. And that is an argument that is, uh, perfectly valid, uh, to make. But because I wanted to talk about it in a global context, and I was including in later episodes how it affected possibly other places, uh, including, you know, Central and South America, um, we talked about it like a global phenomenon. Episode 2, YouTube question. What I find interesting is that Extra History is slowly forming a network by covering so many events and great people, leading to the ability to get from one topic to the next, branching out and meeting again. This is one of my favorite things about having been head writer for the show for, for five years. And if you count shorts, I've done over 300 episodes now. So they lap each other a lot now. And I I'm always so happy about that because... One of the things I love about history is how connected it is, how globally connected it is. And it's just great to be able to say, like, look, this thing is affecting Frederick the Great and the Irish potato famine and, you know, uh, and um, Hansel and Gretel. <laughs> it's just so neat to, to kind of feel how the world is so connected like that. Anyone have any good links or sources about the early Basque fishermen who sailed to North America in pursuit of cod? It was my understanding that they predated most Europeans of the era, though obviously not in such large numbers as Northern European fishermen. Yes, I've linked a Smithsonian article below. Um, it's on the older side, it's 2009, but um, yeah, they're continually finding new things about, about these, these early visitors to the New World, a lot of whom didn't settle, 
you know, come and cut some wood and go. Uh, something else that froze solid was the little belt and little belt of uh, little belt of Denmark, which Sweden could utilize for a surprise attack on Denmark. Um, I was holding this back because we were going to do a short about it, and that's been delayed for, for again, boring for boring uh, reasons. Um, but at, at some point we will have a short about this that will tie back to the Little Ice Age series. Um, I try not to do shorts that are just repetitions of things that were in the episodes. I like to make them give, give them either a new spin or something new, and that's one that I, I, I decided that I was going to hold back. Uh, but, but then I, I got delayed on writing it. Uh, wow, Hansel and Gretel is based on historic events. I'd say it's probably inspired by things that really happened. Um, but uh, yeah, I, and you know, it's, it's upsetting to think about, so I'm not going to go too into it, but you know, abandonment of children or infanticide was something that happened in Europe um, and, you know, globally uh, during times of famine. Um, and uh, even in the Depression, you know, kids were getting left behind because they couldn't afford to feed them. Um, so it's, yeah, it's very dark. And I'm always happy to learn something about fairy tales because um, my, my daughter is at the age where she's obsessed with them. Uh, I'm kind of confused why no one turned to fishing. I'm sure there's an explanation for it. It just seems strange that everyone became so dependent on farming and none thought to build structures to help the hay, keep the hay and livestock food out of the rain or to start fishing and fish as fish love it when it rains. Uh, why didn't the king look for hardier seed crops that could tolerate wet climates like rice? I know it's easier said than done, and we have uh, after insight versus what was currently going on. It just seems strange they stuck with farming so hard that no one sought fishing as an alternative. Um, people along the coast did fish, but you have to remember that this is during a period where the fishing technology doesn't bring in huge amounts of catch. And even if you do get a big load of fish, you know, you're in a race to preserve them so they can be brought inland, right? And, and there's going to be a spoilage rate. And fish isn't something that um, stays good for very long unless it's smoked or salted or dried. And, you know, drying can be a problem if it's raining all the time. Um, so, uh, you know, you are drying and salting like things like cod and, and herring, but, um, you know, even if, if fishing expeditions were successful on a regular basis, which is always an if, um, yeah, that's not going to provide enough food for all of England or all of France, right? Um, and then there's the transport networks in the medieval era are not good enough to get it get it inland in, in any um, major way. And you do see, particularly in England, uh, we talk about it in episode four, this introduction of new crops and new types of growing, um, but that really has to wait until both enclosures and uh, the emergence of uh, scholarly journals that talk about agriculture and uh, people start experimenting with different crops. And, you know, the empire has a part of that too, where they're encountering new crops in other places or realizing that they can breed, uh, breed new strains. Um, so yeah, that, that's why. Episode three, patron question from Eastreak. I would have loved to hear a bit more about the contents of both demonology and Malleus Maleficarum. Uh, although I guess some of it might not fly on YouTube, given that a primary element of Malleus Maleficarum is the justification of torture as a means of extracting confession. Yeah, and, and also like showing uh, the the accused witch the implements they're going to be tortured with is was a step to like describe what the torture was going to be like to scare them into confessing. And uh, if you'll remember, they do this to Joan of Arc, but then they don't follow through on torturing her because they're afraid how it'll make them look. It's probably outside the scope of this video, but it's a cool area of history. I'm glad it was at least uh, mentioned. And he talks about how this these methods allowed this huge narrative of false confessions to, to come about. Um, I wanted to hold some of that back because I am dying, absolutely dying, to do a European witch craze series or something on Matthew Hopkins, which, uh, who was on the vote um, last, uh, 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 last cycle. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't win, but I, I'm very, very interested in this period. I think I bought my first copy of Malleus Maleficarum from a place in Salem when I was 13. YouTube question. I love the details of the show. Showing the Danish flag when talking about Norway because of Denmark, Norway is just one example. Um, some people thought this was a mistake. You know, they do have the same flag at this period. Uh, loved the Temple of Doom seg segue. Always nice to tie in some humor. I'm a huge Indiana Jones fan, obviously. 
Um, I every time I hear about Nerhachi, I think of the nightclub scene with Lache. I've been trying to like figure out a place to get a, like a extended Indiana Jones gag into the show, and I'm very happy I I finally did it. What did I think of Dial of Destiny? Um, I liked it a lot. Um, I think it's, you know, you can't make movies anymore like you did in the late 80s. Just, it's a different environment with insurance, with uh, the kind of technology. Like, in Crusade, they literally, like, hung Harrison Ford off the side of a tank and drove it along a wall and were pouring buckets of sand and grit over his head as it went along. Um, it'd be very difficult to do something like that, especially now, you know, now that he's older. Um, I think it was about as good an Indiana Jones movie as we were going to get at this point in time. And I'm always a fan of more Indiana Jones. I, I love Indiana Jones. And one of the things I love about it is you take it a little less, it takes itself a little less seriously and it's episodic. So if you don't particularly like this movie as much as this movie, like, that's fine. You know, um... For what, it, for what it's worth, which is nothing, my tier list is uh, Last Crusade, because that's the one I saw in the theater, and uh, I love the script. I'm a writer. I, I love the screenplay. Slightly, just tiny hair's breadth uh, below that is, uh, is Raiders, and uh, then um, uh, uh, Fate of Atlantis, the DC Comics series and game. It's my list. I can deal with it. What do I want? And then... Uh, uh, Dial of Destiny, about the same, a little bit above uh, uh, Temple of Doom. I'm not a big Do Temple of Doom fan. Um, I don't hate it. I just, I'm not. Uh, and I feel like it's aging quite poorly. Um, and, you know, then Crystal Skull. Um, and then, uh, which, again, like, I don't hate. It's silly. It's not my favorite. But uh, it has some good moments. And that's what a good indie movie is, is like a series of good moments. So uh, I don't hate that it exists. Sumatra is 1,600 miles from Mount Tambora, not 16,000 miles. I'm going to wait and um, say that after after this one. Uh, at 128, the date should be 1619, not 1690. Um, occasionally, something will happen where it's written one way in the script, and then it gets said a different way, and then uh, it's not caught because it sounds similar. Uh, and I've just internalized what was in the script. And I, I think that both of these were, were examples of that. Uh, and that can make them a little harder to, harder to catch. Um, or like in the case of 1619, uh, Matt says 16, it's 1619, but he says, but Matt says 1690. And then because the narration says 1690 and the 1690 appears on the screen, I'm like, 1690, yep, that matches, you know. I'm sorry, it was my fault. I'm bad with numbers. Sometimes going over these things like over and over and over actually makes you like numb to seeing some of this stuff. And someone said, I'm just impressed they were able to hang someone who doesn't have a neck. Yeah, the rope would just go right through on. I know what you're saying. Uh, episode four, patron question from Margaret L. Carter. This is, a, this is a great little comment. One of my favorite extra history series. However, the section on the year without a summer, the intro concerning the soiree that inspired Frankenstein contains a few errors. In the illustration, Polidori is misspelled. That was a late edition of uh, his name. So I think it, it squeaked by incorrectly uh, as a result of that, because it was put in af after um, our major review. Uh, also, he wrote The Vampire a couple of years later, partly cribbed from an un unfinished piece that would have been Byron's contribution to the Lake Geneva Horror Story Contest. That I didn't know or had forgotten. Um, I, When I read up on it, I was like, oh, I think I do kind of remember this that this was, this was not original to him and that he came up with it later. Um, so that was misremembered on my part. And uh, Mary records that Polidori attempted a tale about a skull-headed lady, and she wasn't Mary Shelley then. Shelley was still married to his first wife. Yes, that was an intentional change because I didn't want to confuse people. Um, you know, this kind of whistle-stop tour, I, I, that was a little too much description for a short intro. Um, but that's probably my second favorite after the, the hanging uh, intro because I, I, I love the thought that there there's all this kind of artistic flowering that comes out of this one small time that is being affected by a little ice age. And um, I, 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 Byron did think the vampire was trash. That was not me commenting. That was kind of, I was sort of speaking through Byron. 
and he has this great quote later that's basically when people were uh, uh, attributing it to him. It was basically like, I didn't write that. Don't associate me with vampires. I don't want anything to do with vampires. <laughs> so his, uh, his opinion of it was not great. Uh, patron question from Red Wizrobe. This is the second time you mentioned Frederick the Great guarding potatoes to make them seem desirable, but I've heard the same story attributed to Antoine Augustine uh, Parmentier, pharmacist during the French Revolution, and to quote Max Miller, who would be crazy enough to steal from Frederick the Great? Um, I didn't realize this story was in question. Um, I've always heard and read it straight, um, but maybe it's a bit of historical myth-making. One of the reasons I specifically put it in is there were some people that were unhappy that I didn't go into all the specifics of that um, when... Uh, uh, when we did our Frederick the Great series. So I thought, as kind of like a mea culpa, I would insert it here since there was a nice nice place for it. A patron question from Flubbadubba. <laughs> that name is hilarious. Uh, is there evidence to suggest the Little Ice Age was actually the beginning of a return to the Deep Freeze since we are technically just in a temperate period during an extended Ice Age? Did the beginning of global warming actually cancel out the natural cycles of Earth that has been moving along at that point? It's interesting to think about. I haven't heard that or read that, but um, yeah, that's an interesting thought. YouTube comments. Uh, there's there's several on Napoleon's invasion of Russia um, that I'm going to try and kind of kind of condense down. Uh, apparently the cold was so late in arriving, which lulled Napoleon into remaining in Moscow for longer than was prudent, but a mid-October dusting of snow and a small defeat by an outlying French army snapped him out of the stasis. He then commanded all French troops to leave Moscow and head to the border 700 kilometers away. As they were leaving Moscow, the Moscow area, the cold came and it became, came in stupid and strong. Good description. By late October, the temperatures had plummeted to negative 4 Celsius. By early December, temperatures had plummeted to negative 30 Celsius, which is insane, especially when I check modern-day weather in Moscow, and temperatures have hovered at around 8C to 0C all this November, until recently when temps have been going down to negative 6C. Yeah, so I mean, again, like it's that unpredictability, right? It's not necessarily that it's just cold, it's that it's suddenly cold when you think it's gonna be warm. The buttons on the coats of Napoleon's troops were made of an alloy of tin and lead that becomes exceptionally brittle when it gets really cold. So when faced with the brutal winter weather, their buttons crumbled to dust and they had problems keeping their coats closed. That's a, that's a, I'd not heard that detail before. That's a very good, very good detail. Uh, and then there was another great comment. From 1866 to 68, there was a drought and famine in Northern Europe. Finland and Sweden were the worst affected. Overall, about 15% perished in Finland. Uh, but in some places, the amount of the population was even higher. In one province, it was a third dead. Um, thank you for... Well, that's, first of all, that's, that's terrible. Um, but thank you for pointing this out, because I have always kind of wondered why some of my Norwegian ancestors chose to immigrate to the United States when they did. I've always kind of joked, like, how bad does your winter have to be that a Massachusetts winter is preferable? And uh, I had always known that they left about this time in, in 1873, and pretty much the whole community went with them. Like, everyone from this area just went, got picked up and moved to the United States. And... Um, I, I, I wonder if this had something to do with it. Thank you, that's, that's, really, that's really neat to know. Coming up on Extra History, Empress Wu Zetian hated by gods and men. Ah, this is gonna be so much fun, and it's such a cool track change from Little Ice Age. This is gonna be uh, a lot of uh, harem politics and religious tension, and it's gonna be great. I think you'll really enjoy it. She's a fascinating figure. <laughs> Not necessarily a likable one, but a very fascinating one. Uh, Sitting Bull, we just finished this series. It's, uh, the art is amazing, and I, uh, I gained a, a really good, deep appreciation of him that I didn't really, uh, have before. I sort of knew the basics about Sitting Bull, but I hadn't read, uh, a full book, much less multiple books about him, and, um, yeah, I can see why it, you know, it's always fascinating when the government that kills you later puts you on a postage stamp, and, you know, ranks you among like great Americans. So it's it's a very interesting series. Uh, Secret Societies in the Shadows. I'm already writing these. They're really fun. Uh, and we're doing some, we're getting a little bit silly with them. Uh, it's going to be a series of them. So it's going to be like one Secret Society at this time, then another one, then another one. Um, and 
our topic we're going to be voting on soon is for science. So it's going to be a biography of a famous scientist or uh, some great discovery or uh, a period of, the, of scientific innovation. Uh, it's going to be great. Ibn Battuta's side trip. So I'm going to send you on a real, real side trip, which is that uh, having just talked about uh, Indiana Jones, I'm sure, and Napoleon, I'm sure one thing you're going to say is like, Rob, what did you think of Ridley Scott's Napoleon? Um, I could tell you in one minute, but uh, I mean, the one line version of it is I didn't hate watching it, but it's a real mess. I'm very curious to see what the four hour version looks like. Um, uh, I, but I did uh, talk about an hour and a half about it on uh, the podcast of our narrator, Matt. He has a podcast called The Only Podcast About Movies. So you can hear both of us talk about Napoleon in that episode, and you can see a link uh, down below that'll take you there. Uh, just language warning, there is there is some swearing. Not from me, I'm a perfect angel. But uh, it, it's, uh, we have a lot, of, I have a lot of thoughts. I had so many thoughts that an hour and a half was not enough to, <laughs> I, at the end when they're wrapping up, I'm like, oh, one more thing. Um, it's a weird movie. Um, I'm someone who tends to like unusual treatments of history on film, actually, but, um, yeah, I'll take any, any, any opportunity to talk about history and pop culture, but it was a, it was a very strange film. Uh, but if you want to hear more, go check out that podcast. See you next time. The biggest bean thanks to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Angelo Valenciana, Arcalite Games, Dominic Valenciana, Izzy Coin, Joseph Blame, Kuya Koy, and Michael Hoggett for being our legendary patrons. 